Hello. Um, John L. Jackson Jr. is currently Dean of the University of Pennsylvania's School of Social Policy and Practice and Professor of Communication, Africana Studies, and Anthropology. Before Penn, he taught cultural anthropology at Duke University, spent three years at as junior fellow at the Harvard University Society of Fellows, and received two masters and a PhD from Columbia University. During his career, Jackson has produced feature-length fiction films and documentaries, as one of which was screened in Europe and South Africa, named Bad Friday, Rastafari after Coral Gardens in the summer of 2013. He has also authored several books, the most recent in the year 2014, titled Impolite Conversations on Race, Politics, Sex, Money, and Religion. He is here today to deliver a talk entitled, What's Love Got to Do With It? Race, Social Justice, and the Anthropology of Feeling. Please welcome Professor Jackson. These are my notes. I'm going to put them here because I will need them. Thank you for that introduction, by the way. Um, and thank you for the invitation. It is a genuine pleasure to be here. I've asked them to give me a lavalier so I can walk around a little bit, um, mostly to keep myself awake. Secondarily, I think it will hopefully help to keep you, um, in some ways, attentive. So what I want to do, even before I start, is to kind of scoop myself a little bit and tell you what the punchline is at the top. Right? And in a sense, what I'm trying to say, ultimately, in an you know, admittedly roundabout way, um, is that race itself, race thinking, is a kind of conspiracy. And I would argue it's a version of a conspiracy that was, in a, in a way, dressed up from its vernacular beginnings by a discipline like anthropology, my own, in scientific garb as a way to make some very specific claims about the social world. Historian George Fredrickson does a nice job, I'm going to do a flat-footed way of laying it out for you, but does a very nice job of explaining some of what race thinking in its most concretized and hardened forms does. Right, so he, and he, he lays this out, as a historian does, with a lot of background, a lot of references and citations, none of which you're going to get from me today, but he makes the distinction between two different moments. An earlier moment, he argues, when we talked about difference as decidedly about differences in the things that you do that are changeable, right? That is to say, you, we meet you, you believe a different set of beliefs about some deity, you eat different things, you operate in the world in a radically different way than we do, and our project then is to turn you and what you do, in a sense, into us. Right? That's a version, he argues, of what might be sp spurned by, spawned by xenophobia. It might still be incredibly violent, that project. But he says it's not the contemporary racial project as we know it today. That what's so interesting and dastardly about the racial project, that we, as we come to think about it, is it starts with the premise you might eat different things, and think different things, and believe a different kind of God. And maybe there's a way that if we convince you enough, if we put enough pressure on you at the barrel of a gun, you would decide to change that, those beliefs, those ideas. But that what's more fundamental about your difference is immutable. Right? They say no matter what we might do to change what you think and feel, that ultimately the difference between you and us is so unabridgeable, so unbridgeable, so unfixable that the project doesn't become a project of turning you into a version of us. Very different project. Again, might be keeping you away from us, might be getting rid of you altogether, but his argument is that's a very different way of understanding what we mean by social difference and how to negotiate it. And that move, he says, is kind of quintessentially a version of what race thinking looks like in the contemporary moment. That there's something about that difference that's so hardwired, so in your body, so unchangeable, that all the other ways we might imagine we could massage the differences in behavior and practice and beliefs to make you us are completely useless, right? because they can't change the essence of what makes you distinctive. And so, in a way, part of what 
I want to argue is that our job is, in a sense, to unlearn that conspiracy, right? to think differently about difference. I do also believe hip hop is a wonderful mechanism for doing that for a whole bunch of reasons. Um, back when, when I was a kid and hip hop was just beginning to become the kind of popular, really sort of globally popular genre and musical form and cultural practice, phenomena even that it is today, there were groups like Public Enemy who made a very strong, I thought, compelling argument that to listen to hip hop is to, in a sense, get a version of what it might mean to think about CNN coming from poor, urban, black and brown communities in America. You're getting the news, right? You're understanding what you wouldn't experience if you weren't in those spaces the same way you'd get news from an anchor explaining to you what's happening in some other part of the world. They said that was the power of hip hop that it gave you a window into a universe you would otherwise not know. It's ugly at times, feels brutal, maybe misogynistic, sexist, there are all these things, but their argument was, this is what it looks like in the world that you don't know. Right? And that was very powerful, I thought it was a very powerful argument at the time. But at the very same time, the other thing I find fascinating about hip hop, and the reason why, I'm not gonna spend a ton of time on hip hop today, we can do a little more, doing q and I mean, it is really the kind of backdrop for the talk, because clearly it's a racialized musical and cultural formation, all these in undeniable ways. But what I find interesting about hip hop is about, besides being able to communicate from these urban spaces, the other powerful thing about this form is that it is profoundly opaque to outsiders. Right? There's something about how hip hop carries its meaning, the density of its rhetoric, of its style, of its flow. There are all these ways in which if you're not an initiated member, a true, serious hip hop head, as they say vernacularly, you can listen to the song eight million times and have no idea what the artist is saying. Or, maybe better put, that your understanding of what the narrative is that the hip hop MC is giving you is the surface meaning. That there are all these latent, hidden, and concealed meanings that hip hop heads themselves hear, and you're not the wiser of. Like you have no ideas going on under the surface of those superficial meanings. And so there's a version of how hip hop does that, that I think one of the reasons why it is incredibly valuable in the contemporary moment, the hip hop theorists who are also interested in conspiracy theories. Because hip hoppers talk about, I would argue hip hoppers talk about three things incessantly. If you really, I haven't done the empirical study, but I think it's kind of true. Right, so one, a lot of stuff about gunplay and violence, clear, connected to issues of machismo and sexism and sex and all that kind of stuff. That we all know, and we've heard that before and heard critiques of it. The second thing, which you might not think about, but I think it's maybe almost as prolific, is references to, mo to, mu to movies, to cinema, to classic films of various kinds as a kind of metaphor for the ways in which they understand their lives and their places in their particular communities. So tons, I mean, incessant references to movies, especially big Hollywood fare. But the third thing you hear all the time, and whether it's, I would argue, kind of more mainstream or at least popular hip hop artists like the Kanye West, or the more underground artists that, if I said the names most folks here wouldn't even know, is they traffic in these conspiracies all the time. Conspiracies about you know, the government being complicit in the proliferation of AIDS. This was one thing you hear in hip hop, even from the likes of folks like Kanye West in some of his music. Right? And, but you can listen to the songs, and because of how quickly the language is moving, because of the density of the poetry, you miss a lot of it. Right? But there are folks who don't miss it, and who see those and read those sort of latent meanings very well. And so I think it's part of the reasons why, when we think about how in the contemporary popular moment, hip hop artists get used, and I think they're used disproportionately, as a way to talk about some of the most interesting conspiracy theories foot. It isn't a surprise to me that the more popular the hip hop artists, the more prominent, the more prevalent the theories about their connection to some of these global conspiracies. And probably if we had to do a poll and say who is the hip hop artist most consistently invoked as a sort of master conspirator. I'm sure you all would all come up with the same name, I think. I I'm, I'm almost, almost want to do a test. Who, who would you say that is? Jay-Z. Who, who, what, what else did you say? Kanye. 
Jay Z and Beyonce, same couple, right? Jay Z and Beyonce. And now, now we don't have to talk a ton now about Jay Z and Beyonce, but I do want to say a couple things. One is there's an anthropologist named Michael Tausig who does this really, I think, interesting work in mostly South America, and especially around what he calls these devil contracts, which are uh, these moments when ostensibly workers who work the land in certain parts of Colombia enter into these packs, these little Faustian packs with the devil to make sure that they have crops, an abundant amount of crops every season. And so there's this ongoing discourse about how prevalent this is, how often these farmers do this work. And he wants to argue that these devil contracts, the idea about these contracts, are clearly, for a whole bunch of reasons, one of the ways in which these folks make sense of the differences between the folks who succeed, right, and you know, have big paydays, who are really successful, and the folks who don't succeed, and how and why they don't succeed. And there's a version of that logic that I would argue is also at play when folks are trying to make sense of the incredible success, translated especially into financial success, of the likes of Jay-Z and Beyonce. Right? Jay-Z has a theory and argument for why people have these crazy ideas that he's part of some global Illuminati Satanist conspiracy to take over the world. He says just because they've never seen anyone with his kind of flow and style. Right? So good, it seems otherworldly. Right? So pe people latch onto these crazy ideas. But it's, it's also, I think, true that folks are also recognizing the extent to which Jay-Z and to a certain extent, Beyonce as well seem to be playing off of these tropes of their own conspiracy. And we can talk about some of that. I'm sure you all probably know more of that than I do. But just one example is that the title of his most recent album, what, what's the title of the most recent Jay-Z album? Which, which means what? Uh, do we know? It's time he woke up and saw the clock. And it, clearly, it's, it's a very... Um, sort of self-reflective album. It's a very personal album, very mature album, people say. And of course, all the conspiracy theorists read it as just one more example of Jay-Z showing his hand, right? Because they read it. How do they read it? But, but how? Why? I mean, for a whole, there are a whole bunch of maneuvers they do, but one of the simplest ones they do is they just turn his 444 upside down. So it's 666, right? And so clearly part of what's happening all the time, and that's what Jay-Z and Beyonce is both this sort of dismissal of all these weird, bizarre theories about their connection to the Illuminati, but also clearly these sort of maybe not quite cloaked attempts to play with this trope as well and, think, and, and, and push it in interesting kinds of ways. But ultimately, I do think what drives a lot of it is this sense that there is something so completely non-standard, non-expected, um, maybe incredible even, about the success of a racialized subject like Jay-Z or Beyonce in the context of a sort of racialized and supremacist society like America. Those, it's hard to reconcile those two things, the argument goes. And it's a version, I guess, of then this idea that the folks who do make it to the promised land, who get this incredible amount of success, must have entered into some version of what Tausig called these devil contracts. And for a lot of folks, it's literally folks like Kanye and Jay-Z and Beyonce entering into these sort of, you know, packs with the Illuminati and being part of this sort of wide-ranging Illuminati conspiracy. Now, there are also hip-hop artists like Professor Griff, who was part of um, Public Enemy not too long ago, and even a lot of the folks who aren't as well-known as Jay-Z but used to run in his circles, who would argue, who would clarify and say that, you know, the Illuminati are about a bunch of multinational, long-standing families, right? This is about kinship. And so Jay-Z could never be a part of the Illuminati, but he could work for the Illuminati, right? So, so all these things, they're the great, but, but all of it's trying to sort of figure out, like, how do we understand this phenomenon that is so atypical, right? And so hard to um, sort of sync up with our understandings of sort of race-based inequities in the contemporary body politic that is U.S. That's one version of reading it. And so I do think part of, so, and I think it's a, it, it's, it's a really interesting, if some might think far-fetched way, to try to make sense of the discrepancies between what we know about racial possibility in a multiracial polity like ours and this sort of meteoric rise of some of these figures.
And so, and there are tons of ways people read. I've written a ton about this stuff and all the kind of iconography people use, and some of it's incredibly interesting. Um, you see it in music videos, you see it in sort of magazine ad campaigns. But what I wanted to think about is, again, this, the earlier move, the earlier conspiracy, about the very notion of race itself, and, and offer up maybe five ways, kind of like the ways people try to make sense of Jay-Z in the context of the contemporary sort of racial community that we have in the US and, and the world. Five ways to kind of unlearn some of what I think maybe is least helpful in our own complicit reproductions of a certain kind of racial logic. Right? So there's five. And, so, and I give you a number because if you're super bored and I'm at three, you know there's only two more. Right? So you can probably <laughs> hang out and make it to the last two. Right? Um, so, 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 that, so that's the backdrop. Right? So the backdrop is race is a conspiracy. It's really where we're going. I do think hip hop is this incredibly fertile place for thinking about how we understand race. And race and achievement is key, right? We go to education a lot. We want to try to figure out how do we understand discrepancies in racial community success vis-a-vis -vis the public or private educational system. That's great. But hip hop is also one of these interesting play, playing grounds for understanding how people make sense of success and failure. And what are the otherworldly ways in which they try to reconcile what seems to be these differences in possibility for folks in a certain kind of um, sort of easily predetermined social collectivity. And, and so that's the backdrop. I think there are five things we can do to maybe even question our own ways of understanding race as conspiracy. The first one of the five is to not be too comfortable and I think anthropology as a discipline is very specifically um, prone to this particular idea. Don't be too um, sort of seduced by the notion that as long as we can disprove race as a biological fact, right? So Frederick said that was the move, right? This move that's not out there in what you do, it's in here and who you are, right? There's a version of what anthropology did in the 19th, early 20th century that said, you know, this is the stuff of science, right? This is, we, the whole project of the field of anthropology was a kind of race science, right? How do we make sense of the sort of racialized differences between communities? And so there's a version now of how anthropology as a discipline, and a lot of the social sciences generally, try to do penance for the ways in which they dressed up folk and vernacular ideas about race in the garb of science. That puts all of their eggs, I would argue, in this deconstructionist basket that says if we can simply convince people that contrary to what we might have said before, race isn't really biologically and genetically real. Right? If we, can, we can show them it's just a cultural construction like anything else. Then maybe we can inoculate them from some of its most pernicious deployments. Right? That's it. And so as a field, I would argue, anthropology has spent the lion's share of its time over the last decade, maybe two decades, trying to make a case for race as social construction. Is, and, and again, with the idea being, if we can win that argument, right, if we can turn the clock back a little bit so we're talking about culture and we're not talking about biology, we have a chance of unlearning and disabusing people of their most pernicious and destructive ways of mobilizing the idea. So that's, in a sense, how anthropology, and I think other disciplines as well, try to understand their project, right? The part of their intellectual project that's also, in a way, a political project. I guess what I would say is, I agree race isn't biologically real, but I also know that alone doesn't get us to the finish line of dealing with racial difference in a multiracial polity like ours, for a whole bunch of reasons. Now, as a student, I should have known this because even as they were spending all this time telling us that race wasn't biologically real and trying to explain to us how and why, and I think, I think we make a very convincing argument for its lack of biological moorings. How at the same time they were showing us that culture on its own, right, without any connection, any sort of grounding in biology, has productive force. Right? That culture does stuff irrespective of biology. Right? And we were getting that idea even as at the same time folks were imagining that the smoking gun for trying to fix the racial project, the racial problem in the US was all linked to social construction, convincing people that race isn't a social construction. And for me, the figure to hold on to when you think about the inadequacy of that as the only way you're addressing issues of race and difference in the US is a guy named Leo Felton. I don't know if you, who've heard, who's heard of Leo Felton? Well, good. It's always good when you, no one's heard of him. 
right? So I'll just tell you, take five seconds. So Leo Felton got infamous, I guess, in around 1999 for being, you know, he, was, he was arrested by the police as part of this conspiracy of neo-Nazi skinheads who were planning to blow up Jewish monuments kind of all around the Boston area. But that's kind of not even the reason why um, he became, and he was, they, were, they were passing off counterfeit bills and Dunkin' Donuts and they, you know, this thing operation. That, that was a big deal. That was already a news story. But what got the story even more traction was when the journalists started to do a little more digging, they found out that Leo Felton was passing as Southern Italian. He was a love child, and he, and he just wanted, there are tons of these examples, not even just all over the US, but all over the world. He was a love child of the 1960s, black bus driver father, white mother, and he was pretending to be a swarthy, quote unquote, Italian, because he argued, and not because he was doing some you know, undercover expose for the New Yorker on neo-Nazis and skin, it wasn't any of that. He was a true believer. But he said what he recognized was that all of his compatriots were what he called racial materialists. Right? They thought race was in your bone and in your blood and in your body. He recognized that wasn't the case. And he could quote anthropologists and philosophers to that effect and let you know race isn't in here at all. His argument was race was a kind of spirit. It was about your soul, it was about a commitment to a certain kind of ideals. And he was committed, he argued, lock, stock, and barrel, in total, to whiteness. But because the other neo-Nazi skinheads he was plotting with weren't quite as enlightened as he was, he had to pretend to be something else. Now, I bring that up only to say there's a, there's a lesson in that story. The lesson is this is someone who, who got the memo that racism biologically real, and it didn't stop him from engaging in the same, the worst versions of what we imagine race thinking can propel us to do. Right, so, that, so there's something in that that should be very educational. Because I, I think profoundly we should recognize we can do the same things under the auspices of culture that we do under the auspices of biology. And we do it all the time. Right? So Leo Felton is kind of the poster child for the recognition that it's not enough to just prove racism biological. It takes more to really unlearn to not continue to be a part of the conspiratorial thinking that makes race sort of ontologically real for us in some fundamental way. So that's, that's the first thing, is not pulling all of our eggs in the social constructionist basket. And, and, and I think part of what makes that maybe difficult is because we always think, well, if race is a social construction, then these identities must be more like, must be like, um, like, like a jacket, like a jacket you put on and take off, right? So if I don't like the way you think about my gender, I take this one off and I put on a different one. Right? Try that one on for size. There's a kind of volunteer, volunteeristic idea behind it. Right? If it's not hardwired, we must have flexibility. We must have agency. And part of what I would argue is the, the metaphor that might be useful is less kind of identities as the clothes you wear and more like sort of layers of, of an onion that you pull, that you pull back. Right? So think about gender, sexuality, and race, and ethnicity, and you realize that it's not that these are fictions that we put on top of who and what we think we are, that we only come to know who and what we imagine ourselves to be in and through them. Without them, at some fundamental, even existential level, we disappear. We don't exist. There's not some other way we come to identity or some sense of self. It's, this is, these are the only ways, these categories, as social, as cultural as they are, they're the only on-ramp to a sense of identitarian reality. And so trying to figure out like, how that complicates this question of what to do after social construction, I think, is really key. So that's, that's one version. Leo Felton reminds us we can't just put our you know, pens and pencils away, zip our bag up, and go on about our business just because we've proven to people race isn't biologically real. Right? There's more that has to be done. And I think part of what anthropology needs to figure out in the 21st century is what more we can add to this ongoing intellectual and popular discourse about race's sort of lack of traditional reality in the ways we've thought about it. So the, the second thing that I think we often get wrong that allows us to be complicit in the con con conspiracies that race thinking um, instantiates is this fear I think we have, and I understand where it comes from, and, and why it's easy to hold on to and accept, but I think it's fundamentally wrong. It, it, it's, it's wrong and it's 
understanding of who and what we are as a species at a fundamental level. So I would argue that one of the things clearly that drives our commitment to race is almost this, this fear of difference itself. Right? This idea that you know, part of what makes it so difficult for us to be able to all get along is that we're all so different. Right? If, there was some, if we were the same, the argument goes, it'd be easier for us. Right? And so somewhere in that difference is the problem. Right? And so part of, if you believe that, then one of the things, again, you're trying to do, maybe not that differently from the, sort of the, the versions of the imperialist projects of yore that George Fredrickson was talking about in those kind of pre-versions of racial antagonism, uh, your idea is, well, clearly we must be able to change you in some ways, to make you more like us. If we do that, then we'll be able to communicate better. You know, we, we, we won't be on the different side on different sides of issues. Like there's a version. I, I understand why difference can feel like the problem, but I also feel like part of what we don't get about our species being, in a sense, is that there's something so in, incredibly and inescapably human about the need to do a version of negotiating difference that we've come to lament as problematic. And, and maybe the example I'd give you for that would be how many science fiction people are there? Couple. So how many folks know Star Trek? Like Star Trek? <laughs> do you know the, the Borg in Star Trek? So, so folks who know the Borg, you know what, I mean, again, I'm, I'm gonna do a very sort of quick and dirty version of the Borg for folks. Tons of folks don't know anything about Star Trek or the Borg. I'm not sure what to make of that. Um, <laughs> but okay, I, I won't pass judgment. Um, I'll just leave it alone. But, but the Borg, it's famous because it's, it's one of these societies that um, you know, our, our, our fearless uh, sort of modern Western US proxies out in space um, have to fend, fend off. And the, the Borg is incredibly difficult as a foe because they can do something we can't do that we often pine for, right? In, in communication media studies, this idea that one of, our, one of the things we long for is being able to communicate, we say like, like angels, quote unquote. But the idea being, you know, we know ultimately that all the ways we try to communicate are doomed to potentially fail, right? We put our foot in our mouth, and we say something inappropriate, we say something offensive. We, like there are all these ways in which, you know, we can even just communicate in a way that doesn't get to the finish line the way we anticipated, right? Or it gets warped by the time it gets decoded by our interlocutors. So there are all these ways in which we could imagine a world we would think would be so much easier if no matter what I thought or said, you got it immediately with no noise, right? No, no distraction, perfectly, carefully, right? There's a version of that that was quintessentially what the Borgian society could pull off. Right? So once one member of the Borg saw, thought, engaged in anything, the entire Borg got it without any discrepancy, right? perfect, crystal clearly. And what's, I think, so incredibly important from an anthropological perspective, and anthropologists love science fiction people, is it explains to us the problem and the way they characterize the Borgs and, and what that society entails. It does a very good job of explaining what's so wrong with that scenario. Because you realize that that kind of communication, that sort of unfettered, sort of non-mistake prone, immediate, unmediated interaction, is exactly what would make us feel like we were part of the most dehumanizing experience you can imagine. Right? That, so you know, we talk in lofty terms about what being human means, what it demands, what it entails. I mean, one of the things it entails, quite honestly, is the ability to keep secrets to be able to not communicate. Clearly, most of the time we feel that is when the communication goes awry, right? We, we, we wish it didn't. But this capacity, this, this opacity, this capacity to keep things from others, right? To force them to use other extrinsic variables and criteria to figure out if they can trust what you're saying. And do it. Like all of that stuff is exactly at the center of what makes us who we are as a species. Without it, we become something else. I don't know what that is, but it's no version, I would argue, of a flourishing human society anyone in this room would want to be a part of. So just thinking about that allows us to remember, I don't think difference and the sort of opacity of interactivity or intersubject intersubjectivity is the problem. It's actually where our humanity, I would argue, at a certain sort of really crucial level springs from. 
And so we need to find solutions in a logic other than simply trying to find some way to dissolve difference. Right? To dissolve difference, I would argue, hold on to the Borgs, because it's a version of what we think about as humanity that would be dissolved with it, would be my argument. And so is it one, two. Right? I mean, and you also have like easy to hold on examples if you get it right. Leo Felton and the board. Third thing in this kind of ongoing conspiracy of racial thinking, and I think we often get wrong. And again, in Q&A, plenty of time to push back, right? So well, you have plenty of time for that. But the third thing I think we might want to reimagine is that there's a version of how we solve any of this stuff that's predicated on prioritizing space for more discussion. Anytime there's an issue, maybe not recently, but in the not so distant past, we'd have a national conversation about it. Let's have a national conversation about race. So that, but these, these attempts to talk more. And I guess part of what I would argue, and maybe ironically enough since I'm talking so much up here, I mean, anthropologists, I listen, I don't talk. This is, these are all aberrations to me. I, I prefer to sit down and listen. But one of the things I would tell you is it's not always, actually, I would, even more, more, more stridently than that, most of the time, talking isn't helpful because the folks talking don't know the way to frame the discussion constructively. Right? So actually talking with folks who don't have the facility to actually talk constructively can sometimes do more harm than good. And that's, and that's everybody. So I would argue that we live in a society where very few people know how to have conversations anymore. We can have debates, right? But we don't listen long enough to really have what I would call genuine discussions. It's, it's one of the things that drew me to anthropology. I was telling um, the class earlier I'm an anthropologist because it allows me to just listen to other people and learn from them. But we don't listen anymore. Maybe we listen long enough to figure out you know, where the weakness is in your argument so we can pounce on it. But other than that, we don't do it. Right? Our, our form of inter intersubjective engagement says as soon as you do something I don't like, especially when the relationships are relatively superficial, they're not substantive, oh, I don't like you, all right, I won't talk to you again. Come almost like a, a reality TV show mentality, right? I vote you off the island. You're fired. You're done. There's, there's a version of that sensibility that's only possible, I would argue, because the talk, the talking, is misconstrued as an end in and of itself. Right? That just to talk is enough. When I would argue, if we're thinking about some of these really pernicious and complicated issues, we should understand talk not as the end game, not as a finish line, right? We're just going to talk and hopefully the talk will be good, as a means to an end, right? Talking about the ways in which we can build community together such that we all feel included might be a way to talk. But that's different from thinking that the talk is the thing itself. And so I think trying to figure out why we're having the conversation becomes important and kind of maybe the most important thing I would highlight is I'm not sure it, is ever really that valuable to think you're going to have a serious conversation with someone you don't know or don't care about, right? So one of the reasons why you would talk, I would argue, is to get to know someone, to genuinely get to know them. But I think part of what you should also be thinking about as the exchange is taking place, I would argue, is are there ways in which we can think about building a form of connection, a collectivity together that benefits us and all the people that we care about. But I think that's a different way to enter into a quote unquote conversation than what we're used to. Right? This isn't some sort of gladiator match where I'm trying to beat you in some debate. It isn't simply about sort of talking about super fit, talking about the weather and what do you think about those you know, Houston Astros who won. Like there are versions of, like there's a function for that kind of talk. We used to call it small talk or something. I mean, and it does a lot of good work. But often what we realize is if we're not talking to someone where we really care about, we want to get to know, who ultimately I would argue, and this is where I'm going to go by the end, someone that we genuinely love, I'm sure there are 
I would argue there are tons of ways in which that conversation goes off the rails quickly. And it's hard, to, no matter how skilled you are, it's hard to keep it in a functional place, I would argue, without some real commitment to the form of sociality that discussion should help you to produce. Right? And so, so I think thinking about what we mean by talk, what we imagine we're doing when we have these discussions, is key. Talk just for the sake of talking, I would argue, especially around issues of race, nine times out of 10, I would argue more harm than good. Right? But we can, you can tell me if you disagree. Fourth thing. I would say that, and this may be in some way, I don't know if it's the most controversial, sometimes they try to frame things in purposefully, I, I told the students, purposefully provocative ways. So we know that if we don't understand our history, we're doomed to do what? Repeat it. And I want to tell you that I completely believe that aphorism. I think it's true. But I think something else is also true, which is that we can know everything there is to know about the history of these ideas, and that there's still things that are unprecedented, emergent, unexpected about the contemporary moment that history alone cannot solve for us. So we're going to have to develop new concepts, new frameworks new theoretical formation, formations that are actually up to the challenge of tackling the now. History only gets us, I would claim, so far. And race is one of these, I think, incredible examples of that. Because ultimately, we're in a world, I would argue, and especially you all, or especially the sort of college students, including and especially maybe even more so the folks, your younger brothers and sisters, the folks who are still in elementary school or junior high school now, they're inhabiting a social community, a, a multiracial community, like none we've seen in the history of America. And what it means is there's a lot that the past can show us. And, and everything we do now is basically built on the, fund, the bedrock of that history. Right? So it's not like there's some, the past isn't relevant. But the past only explains a proportion, a portion of what we are doing now. So the example I would have for you on that is that every year, maybe it doesn't happen around here, but invariably, and often around Halloween time, in, on a college campus somewhere in America, you'll find um, the example that I, I remember the most vividly was a, a school in Florida, Central Florida, kind of all white female basketball team that decided for Halloween they were going to dress up as their friends on the basketball team, complete with blackface, right, and their jerseys. And so they did that. They, friends came over, helped them apply the blackface, they put on their jerseys, they went out, and they were completely shocked that the administration said, what are you all doing? That they were mortified of what these, and the students said, wait a second, wait a second. Like, we know about the history of minstrelsy in the US, like we understand what that project was. And we want you to know that what we're doing is very different from that. Right? You know, that, that was an attempt, this really concerted effort to use entertainment to continue to denigrate the other, right? to dehumanize the other. That's not our project. You didn't know, you didn't have real intimate and substantive relationships with folks across the color lines. We do, right? These are our friends. They're, they're, they're complicit with us in trying to think about ways of re-representing racial difference. So don't, even though this might look like what you all did and what you know and what you're terrified of, it is decidedly not the same thing, was their argument. And I guess part of what I would say is that they're right and they're not right. Right? They, I think they're, they're right in the sense that there are all these interesting new kinds of twists to the story of blackface when you think about it in that context. Right? And when it's predicated on what I think and I believe are genuine relationships across the racial color lines between and among those students. I, I get that. And I think that's real. Now, I also realize that there's something distressing about the idea that a kind of interracial, multiracial bond 
would have to be built on the back of an institution like minstrelsy. Seems like there are other ways to do it. Something skeptical to me about. But, but I still think it's not the same thing. They're right. And so figuring out like, how, how does history help us contextualize this? But then what does this current instantiation of that long traditional um, pursuit and practice tell us about the newness of the now? And that's the stuff history alone, I don't think, can completely solve for us. But it's kind of where the rubber hits the road. Or if we don't get that final part, if we don't figure out that tiny instance there that isn't exactly what we've seen before, we're not going to figure out how to make sense of it and how to use it constructively and productively. It's, it's kind of like when people talk about us sharing you know, 97, 98, a disproportionate amount of our genes with our cousin primates. You know, the small amount we don't share is clearly significant. We've got to figure out what that, and I, and I would argue, in this instance, we've got to figure out what difference that difference makes, no matter how small it might seem, because it explains for everyone what's really distinctive about the contemporary racial moment. And I think that's a big deal. So that's the fourth thing. History is useful. Um, we don't know it. We're doing to repeat it. But by itself, it doesn't get us all the way to the promised land or the finish line. Just can't do it. Because the stuff we're dealing with now, no one has ever had to deal with before. All right? And, so, and, and the, sort of the fifth thing I'll say, so I'm almost done. <laughs> Fifth thing I'll say, although I'll be honest, just because I'm on five doesn't mean five won't take a little bit longer. <laughs> but, but at least I'm at five, right? So at this point, psychologically, you're, you're there, you know we're almost done, you'll be able to get through the end. Um, so W.B. Du Bois, over 100 years ago, was famous for saying, kind of asking this rhetorical question, he actually answered it too, how does it feel to be a problem? I had a have a colleague, um, David Kim at Connecticut College. He and I have gone out on the road a lot. And one of the things I like to get people to think about is the power of Du Bois as someone who theorizes race. But this question of how does it feel to be a problem, I think is a very useful way to understand why I think the issue of love is central to kind of deconstructing and challenging um, and unlearning at a certain level the conspiracy that is race in the modern world. Because part of what you recognize is that when most, especially social scientists, engage that question, they focus on the second half of the query, the problem half. How do we measure it? What are the metrics we use? How do we define the problem? What are the solutions we can bring to bear to solve them? And that's all important. That's where the social scientists are. But I think it isn't trivial that Du Bois begins, how does it feel? to be a problem. Because there's something about the role of affect and emotion and feeling that's key. I think the hip hoppers have really, to go back to hip hop as a way to kind of really hopefully bring this all together and close, there's a phrase in hip hop, and they still use it, although it used to be much even more ubiquitous than it is now, which is a simple question, another kind of rhetorical question. And it was, do you feel me? Anyone heard that? You feel me? And that's how you use it, too. You feel me, right? Like it's kind of, do you hear me? you understand me? Do you know what I'm saying? It's also like, do you connect with me, right? Is there something about how I'm experiencing the world that you, at a fundamental level, also recognize as real, right? You feel me, right? And there's a version of this investment in feeling that I think is so crucial. And it's crucial for a whole bunch of reasons, partly because I think if we're really serious about issues of social justice, about ways in which we want to change our political environment, make it more inclusive, more humane. We're going to have to figure out what we mean by love. One of the things that I will tell you 99 times out of 100, if you talk to any serious white supremacist, any serious one, they will tell you down to a person, including Leo Felton, that they do what they do because they love. That's what they'll tell you. I, I, there was ne yet to, I've yet to find the white supremacist who doesn't believe that. So you might call it a hate crime. You might say they're, they're full of hate. They will tell you absolutely not. They do what they do because they love. And I believe them. They say it sincerely. And I think the issue is they've been taught to love the way we've all been taught to love. In these very narrow, us, them, sort of non-inclusive ways. It's almost a, a version of, of weaponizing love, such that once we know who we are, and we know we love us, 
then anyone not in the fold is either someone we're indifferent to or a potential threat to the folks we love. And we'll do anything to protect our loved ones, right? We recognize that. And so one of the ways in which we're trying to think at our School of Social Policy and Practice, we call it Penn Social Justice School, about this is to say, well, are there, way, are there better and worse ways to teach students to think about the way they love? Can we curricularize a kind of critical love studies that shows students the value, not just the value in some sort of Pollyannish, you know, kumbaya kind of way, but the value to the work they want to do in the world around homelessness or mass incarceration or child welfare and well-being, the value of, of thinking about how their investments, their affective, emotion-laden investments, their versions of loving impact their capacity to identify with and really effectively conceptualize and, and tackle the issues that they care most about. Now this came home to me, I think, most dramatically, and, I'll, and I will promise to close relatively soon, when I, very soon. When I was talking to my first year as dean, I went around to visit some of the places where our students do internships and field placements all around the city of Philadelphia. And there was uh, a high school principal who sat me down in his office and told me in over 30 minutes that he didn't hire a single person to mop the floor in that high school building, to distribute food in that building to the students, let alone to teach math or reading or anything else, unless those people proved to him beyond any doubt that they loved those kids. He said if they didn't, if, they, if he didn't feel completely confident that those folks love those young people, he said he didn't want them anywhere near his building. He said we can't teach them a thing if they don't believe that they're loved by the folks in that space. And I just remember, I mean, so initially my response was simply, I mean I got goosebumps because I just never hear principals talking in those terms. It just sounded so amazing to me. But that isn't even what sealed the deal for me. Right after I left his office, I got a little tour of the building just with the students. And it was clear to me that they felt loved. And in a place like Philadelphia, to be in um, under-resourced, poor community with other brown and black bodies, is to recognize that there's a lot of non-loving going on. I remember just the year before, I had taught with this very ambitious course with Penn undergraduates and high school students in, in a different high school in Philadelphia. And after our first meeting at the high school with the students, we were, they were all collaborating. It was a really ambitious course. They did a fantastic job on a documentary film about public education in Philadelphia. Right? So our students had to learn about public education in general, how it's manifested and negotiated in a place like Philadelphia, which has all this kind of complicated history and contemporary political machinations. Then they had to learn the school itself. They had to in engage with the students. On, and then on top of all that, none of these folks knew anything about filmmaking. So they had to learn film. They had to learn what we were calling ethnographic practice. I mean, there's so much I was asking them to do, not even in a year, in a semester. Right? And they did it all. But after our first session in West Philadelphia High School, I thought maybe it wasn't going to work. Because when we got back to Penn, it's almost like I had to have an intervention with the Penn students because they were so traumatized by what they saw that first day in that high school. And, and I hadn't, again, met that principal yet, so I didn't know that this, and I do believe now it's the, the most effective way, the most accurate way to frame what our students were responding to, what they saw. What they saw that first moment and what we had to negotiate all semester and the next time we did it with a documentary film about police brutality with a different set of high school students, where they saw, saw young people who looked at the landscape and I think very accurately determined that they're not loved. That if they were, the, the world they were experiencing wouldn't be the world they were experiencing. That, that, that couldn't be the case if they were genuinely loved. And this is a context where they would lose teachers in the middle of the semester because they would run out of funding. Right? Even our teacher for that class, film teacher, was in and out of the class three times over the two semesters we taught the class, right? because of funding issues. And so in that context, to me, it's not far-fetched to imagine that if you're assessing what's happening, one of the ways you make sense of it is to just recognize that there has to be some deficit of love that would allow this to happen, right? that would allow folks to imagine this is a reality that we're okay with. Economist Glenn Lowry, I thought, did the best uh, job a few years ago of explaining kind of what 
I think is the fundamental issue here. And he was talking, and it's come back again now when we talk about opioids versus crack cocaine and how people deal with those different dilemmas, right? So his argument basically was, if folks in the suburbs, especially white Americans in the suburbs, <laughs> thought about the lives of brown and black poor people in this inner city as our lives and our concerns and our problems, they would negotiate it with them much differently. They would deal with them much differently, much more urgently, much more humanely than if those problems were simply their problems. Right? If it's their problem, they got to deal with it. If it's our problem, we have to deal with it. And, there's, and, and now in the contemporary discussion about how both the government and the media is responding to the opioid epidemic, this same discussion is resurfacing. But folks are saying, wait a second. This kind of, again, wonderfully humane and civilized and constructive way in which folks are talking about opioid addiction in the contemporary moment given its practitioners seems very different from the rhetoric, from the language, from the framing of the issue when there's crack cocaine in the inner city. May or may not be true, but I think in some, ver some versions of that debate or that distinction are clearly <laughs> empirically verifiable. And it says something, I think, about how we understand the link between our kind of affective commitments to the communities of care we're involved in and our relative indifference or words to the folks who aren't a member of those communities. So, so, so I guess I would just end by saying one of the things I would offer up is a lot of what conspiracy theorizing is about and the conspiracies themselves that the theorists imagine to be out there. Again, there are probably tons of conspiracies out there. So one of the empirical questions is which ones are or aren't true. Some seem very clearly, verifiably cuckoo. But I would also argue that there's a lot of things we all believe and take for granted about the world that other folks would find you know, justifiably kooky too. But ultimately, I do think there's a version of how we understand conspiracies and the way we frame kind of global causal mechanisms that also pivot quite specifically, inescapably, on how we answer the question of who are the folks we love and who's threatening them. And I, I would argue most conspiracy theories pivot quite decidedly on that particular dynamic. And to have the answers to it, I always tell people, you, you know, you let me know who someone loves, I'll tell you what kind of policy they want to institute. I'll tell you everything you need to know about their political and ideological commitments. Like, it's not a trivial thing. So is there a way to think about it occupying the public sphere in other than a seemingly superficial manner? I think if we don't figure it out, we're going to have a hard time fixing the kinds of problems that conspiracy theories thrive on. And we're also going to have difficulty creating the kind of just, inclusive world that we all say we want to be a part of. So I'll stop there. Thank you.